The New York Times, a former newspaper, has issued new guidelines for dealing with coronavirus. The Times says the purpose of the guidelines is, quote, to reframe America's attitude by mingling abject terror with the promise that absolute subservience will create an illusion of safety until you still get sick and die, but at least you'll die poor and enslaved, which will make it much easier to kiss this crappy life goodbye, unquote. According to the Times guidelines, the virus is very dangerous if you are a person over 65 or who will one day be over 65 or who once saw someone who was 65 or who loves his grandma because she used to bake those great chocolate chip cookies and yet will cause her to die a lingering death if you should think bad thoughts about the government or call her on the phone. Symptoms of the coronavirus include coughing up your lungs while lying curled up on the kitchen floor groaning in agony or a runny nose or sneezing or thinking too much about sneezing, or having once sneezed, or disobeying lockdown orders, or thinking about disobeying lockdown orders, or shutting your windows so that the police drone can't watch you go to the bathroom when you're thinking about disobeying lockdown orders, or sneezing, preparatory to coughing up your lungs in agony, and then killing your grandmother. The Times says cities and states should be able to begin opening up their economies after people stop getting sick of the virus, or dying of the virus, or getting sick of other causes, or dying in any way, shape, or form, or taking risks, or having hopes, or believing they can be free without killing their grandmothers or otherwise damaging themselves or others. At that point, citizens will be allowed to curl up in a ball and suck their thumbs or take a walk around the living room. The Times says these guidelines will be relaxed once a cure is found or Donald Trump leaves office. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. I'm the hunky-dunky, life is tickety-boo. Birds are winging, also singing, hunky dunky dee dee. Ship shaped, tipsy topsy, the world is a bitty zing. It's a wonderful day, hurrah, hooray! It makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray! Oh, hooray, hurrah! Well, yesterday, the New York Times won the Pulitzer Prize for falsehood. The Pulitzer Committee gave the Times an award for their 1619 project, a piece of leftist propaganda meant by the Times' own admission to, quote, reframe our country's history. We're going to be talking a little bit more about this later on. The project, which will be taught in some schools, does this by a process which sometimes goes by the technical name of lying. In this case, they claim that the American Revolution was an attempt to protect the institution of slavery from British abolition. This is literally not true by which I mean it's not what actually happened. Not only do those who st- those historians who know the period best agree that this is not a true story, and the Times never consulted any of them, but even a cursory glance at the writings of the founders will tell you that this was not their reasoning or intent. So it's a lie. It's a lie propagated by a former newspaper, and now it's been rewarded with what is often considered the highest prize in journalism, which has besmirched itself. This comes at a time when public schools are teaching young children completely unproven theories about gender in the hopes of rewriting the basic facts of human life. It comes when businesses, in fear of being sued, are firing people for making perfectly reasonable and probably true statements about the differences between men and women. And when some scientists and academics are under heavy pressure to abandon any research into sensitive issues concerning race or gender. Leftist culture makers, in keeping with the history of leftism since Marx, are seeking essentially to put forward the virtue of untruth with this misguided idea that comfortable lies can become the truth if only those who speak the truth can be shamed or forced into silence. This, of course, is the situation depicted in George Orwell's 1984, a novel based on the Soviet Union. It is the whole project of the Marxist takeover of our institutions in the U.S., a takeover that was itself in part an attempt to rewrite the failure of the Soviet Union and to erase the fact that the dream of state ownership and perfect equality always turns out to hide a reality of oppression, poverty, and death. A nation cannot continue free in a state of enforced delusion. Freedom requires truth-telling, and truth-telling requires everyday courage, exactly what the New York Times and other leftist organizations are now designed to discourage. The Times and its leftist cronies are little factories for manufacturing fear and self-doubt and a quivering sense that it's best to keep your mouth shut lest you say something that reveals you to be beyond the leftist pale and thus cost you your Twitter platform or your reputation or your job. 
When I say fighting back requires everyday courage, I mean this. If we care about our country and we care about our country's freedom, we can't just talk about the about defeating the left-wing empire of lies. We have to actually defeat it every single day because it's an operation every single day. We have to speak the truth without hatred, but without fear and normalize speaking truth, even when it's uncomfortable and costs us. If you want to know a project whose purpose is slavery, it's the 1619 Project, not America. For the Times to produce the project, was just despicable. But to give them a prize for it is grotesque. To have these major institutions openly dedicated to the virtue of dishonesty is a true danger to freedom. If they make us afraid, we win. If we live in silence, they win. We won't let that happen. All right, we're going to talk more about the 1619 Project. It really needs to be discussed. Let us talk first about Nutrafol. I know know a lot of you, a lot of you sit at home thinking, how can I look as great as Andrew Clavin? But none of the people who are thinking that are women. Why? Because women like having hair. (laughs) You know, women, they're irrational. Who knows? They think, "Ah, I want to have hair. I can't understand it, but there you are. But you don't want your hair to be thinning like mine is thin to the point of non-existent. And nearly half of all women do experience thinning hair by as early as age 40. 30 million women experience hair loss. Nutrafol can help you with this. And we are in the process. It has gone through major tests. It has actually been tried out. Nutrafol uh, will help you have thicker hair and grow thicker, fuller, healthier hair. But we in the Daily Wire are actually testing this off on one of our hapless female employees uh, who has been forced into this by our cruelty. No, no, no. She's happy to do it. And she's going to get back to us and tell us how well it works. It's formulated with potent botanicals to help you grow hair as strong as you are. And it's physician formulated to be 100 percent drug free. Visit Nutrafol.com and take their hair wellness quiz for customized product recommendations that put the power to grow thicker, stronger hair back into your hands. You can grow thicker, healthier hair and support our show by going to Nutrafol.com and using promo code Clavin to get 20% off. This is their best offer available anywhere. Plus, the shipping is free on every order. Get 20% off at Nutrafol.com, promo code Clavin. Their best offer anywhere, 20% off at Nutrafol.com, spelled Nutrafol, <laughs> spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L.com, promo code Clavin for hair as strong as you are. But how do you spell Clavin is the question. It's okay. <laughs> there, there, are are no easy easy. <laughs> there are no easy things. I just make it look this easy. It's incredible, I know. Let me put forward a theory to you. White guilt about black people is good for elite people. It's good for elite whites who like being blamed so they can go about their business without feeling guilt, thinking they've taken care of this issue and they can go about doing what they do, which is doing well in the world. And it's good for black elites who can use it on white elites to get the rewards that you get from white elites, like the Pulitzer Prize. You see this with Ta-Nehisi Coates. He won every possible prize in the world. The engineer of this 1619 project uh, is a woman named Nicole Hannah-Jones. If you go out back over her resume, Every award in the world, white people give awards to black people who peddle black guilt, who peddle white guilt because it's good for white elites and it's good for black elites. The people that it's bad for is all the people who are not elites, especially black people. It is not good for black people. And this is the thing. You know, I a long time ago, I had an argument. I'll go through this very quickly and we'll get back to this. I had an argument with one of the most prominent black authors in the Western world. And he pulled this white guilt on me and I went after him. We were having lunch together and I just started really giving it to him and saying, this is garbage. You know it's garbage. You do better than anybody else in the world. You're doing fine. You're just using it because people reward you for it. White people reward you for it. The guy actually thanked me for being honest with him. I don't think he agreed with me. He didn't agree with me, but he said, at least you came out and said what I think a lot of these people are thinking. It's it's a scam and it hurts black people. It hurts black people who aren't elites. A very few number. I've seen college presidents do this, pull this black guilt stuff. I've seen all kinds of black elites do it. It works for them because they're working with white elites and it satisfies their sense of guilt. It does not work for the ordinary rank and file black American. And that's why they get, they get prizes for it. I mean, this is why they get prizes for it. So let's take a look at the 1619 Project. It really is worth looking at. The idea of this, it started out, it started out by claiming 
that the purpose of the American Revolution was to protect the institution of slavery from those wonderful British who had decided slavery was bad. And this is just, just not true. Very soon after they came out with it, they published this weaselly, we, because all the historians went like, no, that's not, that's not the case. They published this weaselly correction. Uh, very small print, very small print. And you had to hit a link to get to it. But it said, today we are making a clarification to a passage in an essay from the 1619 Project that has sparked a great deal of online debate. The passage in question states that one primary reason the colonists fought the American Revolution was to protect the institution of slavery. This assertion has elicited criticism from some historians and support from others. I'm not aware of any real historian, an expert in this uh, period, who got gave them support. But I suppose there are historians who will say anything, so I guess they got some. We stand behind the basic point, which is that, now listen to the weasel. These guys are weasels which is that among the various motivations that drove the patriots toward independence was a concern that the British would seek or were already seeking to disrupt in various ways the entrenched systems of American slavery. It's just (laughs) what the British said was, if you fight for us, we'll set you free. If slaves revolt and they fight on the British side, we'll set you free. And that did worry a couple of planters. I mean, it worried some some planters that their slaves would revolt. They also, the British had had a ruling that said that in Britain, slavery was not in keeping with British law in Britain, but they didn't give away their slaves overseas. And it was really, as we'll discuss, it was really the revolutionaries, the American revolutionaries who made slavery untenable throughout the world. The weasel words continue in this thing. One of the writers is a guy named Jake Silverstein. And here's what he writes. The goal... I mean, it's just, it really is amazing when you actually look at it. And the idea, the fact that they're taking this on in high schools and teaching it is indicative of the fact that the white elites who teach in schools, okay, the educated white people who teach in schools, it's good for them. It makes them feel good. And it's good for the black people who are moving in these in these same elite circles because they can use it on the white people, but it's not good for ordinary people. Jake Silverstein writes, the goal of the 1619 Project is to reframe American history by considering what it would mean to regard 1619 as our nation's birth year. Let me reread that because I just want you to hear the weaselness of Jake Silverstein's prose. I mean, if I wrote prose like this, my wife would hit me over the head. I mean, like it's just so weaselly. The goal of the 1619 Project is to reframe American history by considering what it would mean to regard 1619 as our nation's birth year. Now, what if when you consider it, you think like, eh, that's not true. Then do you not reframe American history? And what, how does it reframe American history to considering? How about if I reframe American history by considering whether aliens came and actually were the founding fathers? I mean, I could, you know, what does it even mean? It, it is actually mean, means nothing. It says doing so requires us to place the consequences of slavery and the contributions of black America at the very center of the story we tell ourselves about who we are as a country. And this is the other premise of this, that somehow we just don't talk enough about race. Remember Eric Holder saying this, we just don't have the conversation about race. I mean, to me, it would help everybody if we would just shut up about race for a minute. But in fact, what the left does and what it always does is it adopts the mode of the oppressor. The left always starts out by saying racism is wrong and then always says, no, no, our racism is right. All racism is right. Believe all women, but don't believe women when they accuse us. They always adopt the mode of the oppressor because leftism is oppressive. And leftism is oppressive because it does not conform to human nature. That's why it has to be oppressive, because you have to stop people from being people in order to have leftism. So here's Nicole Hannah-Jones, the architect of this 1619 propaganda. This is cut six, uh, basically selling this idea. We don't know about 1619 the same way that we don't learn very much about slavery. It is shameful. No one wants to talk about their sins or the worst moments. And um, slavery gives contradiction to our entire creation story of the United States. And so we've tried to push it aside. We've tried to make it marginal. And in doing that, we've marginalized the 40 million descendants of the enslaved as well. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do with this project is force us to confront the truth. And then maybe we can actually start to, to move past slavery and become the country um, that was written in our ideals in the Constitution and the Declaration. It's an effort. Now, the reason I say this is good for elites is you only have to listen to her saying, oh, we well, don't talk about slavery in this country. <laughs> you know, is, 
Is that in keeping with the life of anybody? Is it in keeping with the life of anybody that we don't talk about race and the descendants of slaves and slavery in this country? Is that in keeping with anybody's life, with anybody's education in this day and age? Of course, it's not. So why can she say it without the person across from her? And I forget which which of the networks that was on. But why can she say it without the, the interview going, whoa, 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 wait a minute. What? We don't talk about slavery. We don't talk about black people. What are you talking about? You know, you're you're a, a big time person. You win every prize. Here you are on TV, on the networks, on TV. How can you say how can you say that? The reason is it's a system among those people that you're watching, these elites, for passing back this back myth, mythology back and forth, which allows Nicole Hannah-Jones to rise up in that system and win all the awards, and it allows the white people who are already in that system to feel that they've done the job and can go about making all the money they want without feeling guilty, right? That's the system. That's the system, and that's why it works. That's why when Ta-Nehisi Coates says we have to have uh, reparations for slavery, which you only have to use your imagination for one minute to see that that's not going to help anybody. It's not going to do a damn thing for anybody. In fact, it would probably be really damaging for people. The minute you he, he says that, he wins every prize. So the Genius Award, this award, that award, you know, because it is one form of elites giving prizes to another form of elites for keeping this system in place that keeps them both above the rest of us. And the thing about it is, is I have no problem with there being elites. I have problems with them lying in such a way that it hurts people. It hurts black people who are not doing as well in this country because they are treated essentially in a racist way uh, by by the left. I mean, this is the thing. If you stop treating people, the only way to get rid of racism is to stop. It's to stop. I mean, you know, even as we see in this um, in this moment, uh, you know, more than 70 percent of black children are born to unwed mothers. 16 percent of black households are married couples with children, the lowest of any racial group in the United States. This Chinese flu is killing black people. And when the uh, the Surgeon General came out and said, you know, we, we know there are a lot of reasons for this. And he went through every possible reason why it's killing black people. He said one of them is, you know, black people drink and smoke more. So you might want to stop doing that and, and also stop going to parties without masks and things like that. He was absolutely embasted. One of the people who lambasted him was Nicole Hannah-Jones. The fact is, the fact is, OK, that this country is unique in its attitude toward race. It is unique. Never before, maybe a little bit in ancient Rome, maybe somewhat in ancient Rome, never before has a country said anybody can become an American regardless of race, creed or color. Right. And obviously slavery, which was only in the southern states, was a betrayal of that principle. And it's the principle, the principle that had to be destroyed, but it's the principle that the Americans created. So it took time for it to work through the system. We had a civil war because of that. And, you know, this is the other thing that uh, that uh, Hannah, Nicole Hannah Jones puts forward, this idea that it, that somehow this it was blacks who liberated themselves. And I, this is like a self-esteem move, I guess. It's cut five. When you think about the fact that when Thomas Jefferson is writing the Declaration and laying out these uh, words for liberation, that you know all, all men are created, created equal, equal. Yes. and yes. born with inalienable rights, and while he's writing that, he owns 130 human beings who are in absolute bondage, and in fact, his brother-in-law is sitting there with him, enslaved to help keep him comfortable. What that means is those ideals were not true when they were written, but Black Americans took those ideals literally, and Black Americans have really fought. Um, you can look at what happens after Reconstruction. You look at the abolitionist movement. You can look at the civil rights movement. Black people have fought to make those ideals real. You know, I've heard this notion. I guess this goes around. The, I heard this from Dave Chappelle, the comedian, who said the blacks freed themselves. Now, the problem with this, aside from being untrue, aside from it being untrue, is that it actually discounts the true black contribution to this country, which is that in fighting for their freedom, they did unite with white people fighting for their freedom and prove the fact that it's principle and ideas that unite us. It's principles and ideas that free us. It's not color. And, you know, of course, it, 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 in, in fact, of course, black people were part of the fight for freedom. There were black people who were part of the fight for freedom. But a lot of those people lying dead in the battlefields of the Civil War were white. And a lot of the people and it really it was the northern states that started the slavery movement throughout the world. It was the northern states that were the key to the slavery movement throughout the world. And of course, it was white people in those states. If it hadn't been, it never would have happened. And the thing is, it's the principle. It's the principle that unites us. It's the principle that's more important than race. And they're doing the exact opposite of what needs to be done to make that the way that Americans think. 
All right, let us stop for just a moment and talk about NetSuite, one of our favorite sponsors. We love our sponsors because they're sticking with us, and we hope you will stick with them if you can. I know that small businesses are suffering, and that's why this is the moment when you need NetSuite. There's enough uncertainty going around. NetSuite reduces uncertainty by giving you visibility and control over your business. With so many critical decisions to make, you need the right numbers, and you need them right now. NetSuite by Oracle is the world's number one cloud business system. With NetSuite, you get financials, cash flow, payroll, inventory, and more all in one place. So you have clear visibility and total control of what's going on. NetSuite customers have the flexibility to work from anywhere with immediate clarity on critical information right at their fingertips. That, how could that be any more important than it is right now? You don't need guessing. You don't need waiting. You make smarter decisions with confidence because you've got crystal clear visibility in your numbers. Join over 20,000 companies who trust NetSuite to stay in control, and you can receive a free guide managing business uncertainty and schedule your free product tour right now at netsuite.com slash Clavin. Don't wait. Get your free guide and schedule your free product tour at netsuite.com slash Clavin, netsuite.com slash Clavin. You want to go have one place to go when you need to know how to spell Clavin. It's K-L-A-V-A-N. <laughs> There are no E's in Clavin. So, you know, this this thing about the empire of lies is really true. And like like all empires, it is imperial. It actually goes after truth wherever it hears it. And another place where this is in play uh, is is China, this China thing. I mean, we just see this in the press and it really it really raises incredibly interesting questions, interesting to me about all the way we all the ways we feel about things all the way you know when you saw when you saw Nicole Hannah Jones making those statements those completely untrue statements on a network TV show and no one pushing back about it you ask yourself well why why is that happening why is it happening now with China as well you know the Washington Examiner says and this is this has been coming out of the administration a majority of the US intelligence community 17 spy agencies believe the coronavirus likely originated with an accidental lab escape from a laboratory in Wuhan, China. It comes senior from intelli- China. The senior intelligence official told the Washington Examiner. That was not the senior intelligence official. Uh, and, and this has been coming out. Remember, remember when the 17 spy agencies all agreed that Russia had interfered in our elections, which everybody knew it always interferes in our elections. And that was quoted again and again and again as some kind of proof against Donald Trump. Well, now, you know, we're getting we're being told, I think I think it's three fourths, two thirds. I can't remember. It's a large majority of the 17 spy agencies believe that the Chinese virus came out of a lab in Wuhan. That doesn't mean it was manufactured, but it means it escaped as they were experimenting over. It. And Tom Cotton, Senator Tom Cotton, has been saying this repeatedly. Let's play his quote. All of the evidence points at one of those two labs in Wuhan where they researched bat-based coronaviruses. We know that Chinese lied about it originating in the food market from uh, at least as far back as January, where they apparently didn't even sell bats of any kind, much less the species of bat from which we believe this virus migrated from uh, or into humans. Um, But all of the evidence, although it's circumstantial to be sure, points at those labs. If Mm -hmm. China wants to dispel any kind of suspicion about those labs, which is uh, pre- present all over the world, then they should open up their labs and open up Wuhan and tell us exactly yeah. what happened there and let us review all the safety protocols in place. You know, if, if this is the case, and it really does seem to be the case, I mean, I don't think, you know, I don't think Tom Cotton is lying. He's always been a really straight shooter. And he's been an incredible straight shooter. In fact, his record is really good on this. So how do you explain this report from Nora O'Donnell at CBS as she reports on this? Listen carefully to what to the stuff they say. President Trump and his secretary of state say there's evidence a Wuhan China research lab is the source of the outbreak. That's a conclusion at odds with U.S. intelligence. CBS's Ben Tracy is at the White House for us tonight. Ben. Nora, despite the U.S. now having more than twice as many deaths as any other country, President Trump continues to tout his administration's response to the pandemic. He also continues to blame China for the virus and the rising death toll. President Trump is threatening China with more tariffs, and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is now backing the president's claim that the virus originated in a Chinese lab. So that seems fair, right? (laughs) In spite of the fact that we have twice as many uh, deaths in uh, America, which, first of all, we have no idea what the other huge countries like China and Russia, what their numbers are. We know so, so little about the numbers 
all, all in all. But again, you know, this is a federalist country. If you cut New York state off from this country, we, we'd have very few deaths. So it's, it's ridiculous. And it's not a question of per capita. You know, the rate is high here because of New York. But again, you know, a lot of our states are bigger than a lot of countries. And so it's really just this kind of, uh, what, what is the point, I guess, is what I'm asking. Why are they doing that? Why, why do they rush to say it's out of keeping with intelligence when, in fact, a lot of intelligence sources are saying it was the Chinese who let this loose. The Chinese have always lied. The Chinese, as we have talked about, are responsible for incredible atrocities, putting Uyghur Muslims in uh concentration camps. There's nothing in America. There really is nothing in America today that compares to the kind of disastrous cruelty that the Chinese government has uh, exercised over the last 50 years, and uh, in, including the absolute slaughter of people, the forced abortions, the starvations because of Mao. I mean, it's just been a, a, a country of one atrocity after another. And, and, you know, there's nothing like this in America. And what is this kind of will among elites? And that's who we're talking about. We're talking about people who do very well by this country, who dreamed, I think, of doing better in a globalist world run by global organizations like the UN, and are now frustrated that Donald Trump seems to be standing in the way of that and are now like just unleashing on our country. You know, Politico sent out a tweet yesterday. Trump is getting roasted on Chinese Twitter for his virus response, highlighting a broad verdict there. America disastrously faltered while China outperformed. So in other words, Chinese Twitter, which is an organ of the state, an organ of the communist government, is being tweeted by Politico as being a giving a broad swath of opinion from the Chinese that America disastrously faltered while China outperformed. So the Chinese government is saying we faltered while they outperformed. And Politico is tweeting it as the will of the Chinese people. Let me just go to the article. When you click on the political article, it says Chinese social media is a highly imperfect lens into widespread public sentiment, full of hot tempers, trolls, and the ever-present specter of censorship, particularly given the ruling Communist Party's power and proclivity to punish dissenting voices. Talk about weasel words. Twitter is an instrument of the state, and if there are independent people on Twitter, they know that they've got to say what the state wants or bingo, you're gone and your organs are pumping away in somebody else's body. You know, I mean, so what are they talking about and why? You know, Andy Lack uh, got fired, basically. He got thrown out of NBC. He was the guy, one of the guys uh, heading NBC and one of the guys who was, according to Ronan Farrow, responsible for killing the Harvey Weinstein story. One of the guys responsible for covering up for Matt Lauer's depredations there. Uh, his the, his boss, uh, Oppenheim, I think his name is, uh, yeah, his name is, he's still there. Uh, so this is just part of a reorganization they're doing. But why is it this guy gets to walk away like this without any shame, without anything? And I'm sure he got a good package too. You know, yesterday, Tucker Carlson had... Uh, this guy, this uh, Rich McHugh, who was a former NBC producer on, and he says that Andy Lack's leaving has to do with a an investigation by the New York Attorney General into uh, charges of sexual harassment throughout NBC. Here's McHugh. One has to assume that they, they caught wind of this investigation uh, because it's been going on for months and they've spoken to dozens of employees. So I believe that that has a role to play in it. And you know, there's new management at the top, and so they've decided, you know, we're going to try and get away from this black guy um, who presided over the Harvey Weinstein story and the Lauer disgrace and all of it. So this is a, this is a good first step, I should say. Yes. Um, but, I, but I should point out that I've, I've spoken to a number of women, um, you know, victims uh, who've worked at NBC, and they say, you know, the fact that this Andy Lack gets to walk out of the building, um, you know, on his own accord is a disgrace. Um, their, their, you know, their careers have been ruined. I personally left NBC largely because of, you know, things that he and, and other executives did with our reporting on the Weinstein story. So, uh, you know, the fact that he, he can just kind of walk away is, is, is upsetting. And, and remember, too, these are the guys who held on to the tape of Donald Trump uh, saying kind of grotesque things about when, what women will let you do if you're a celebrity. They held on to it until they thought it could hurt uh, Trump in the election and then released it. Uh, so they're real champions of women uh, when it serves their political point of view. And, you know, yesterday I was talking about 
reporters and talking about the fact that these a lot of these people aren't evil people. Like, I don't believe Martha Raddatz is an evil person. I don't believe, um, you know, uh, Jonathan Carl is an evil person. And, and I've known people in the, in the business and all this, and I know that they do not know, a lot of them, what they're doing. They know not what they do. And somebody attacked me on Twitter saying, you're wrong. You know, if, they, if people do it wrong, that they're bad people. Well, they may be bad at being people, but the point I was trying to make is that it's really important to understand what other people are doing, and you don't understand what other people are doing if you turn them into cartoon villains. I'm not letting anybody off the hook. Do not get me wrong. I am not letting anybody off the hook. If you are attacking, if you're at Politico and you are putting forward Chinese Twitter as if it said something about what the Chinese people think, you're betraying the Chinese people. And this is the thing. You know, when you do these things like the 1619 Project that actually makes is going to make life worse for ordinary black people by making them think that they're still under the heel or that some kind of erasure of the past will help them or that some kind of reparations from the past will help them instead of what will really help them which is the education they need to get and are not being allowed to get because of of leftist teachers unions. When you do that to people, you're doing something wrong. But I do not believe they understand the wrong thing they're doing. This is a we have got a polluted communication system. It's been polluted by leftism and it affects even the people in it. And I'm trying to get to the point that it is the principle and the ideas that are destroying them, not some kind of cartoon villainy. All right. Let us talk about Ring. I know you're at home and you don't probably need to have, be able to see uh, who's at your door from far away, but you do want to be able to protect your property and to see around your property, no matter where you are in your home. You want to be able to talk to anybody who tries to get in. You want to be able to see people delivering, because I know we're all getting a lot of deliveries, and you want to be able to see people delivering. You want to be able to check on the packages that are being left outside and make sure Ring can help you with all of that. They're on a mission to make neighborhoods safer. Their home security products are designed to give you peace of mind around the clock, from video doorbells and security cameras to smart security security lighting, and alarm systems. Ring has everything you need to make sure your family and belongings are safe and secure anytime, anywhere. And with the all-new Ring Video Doorbell 3, you can keep an even closer eye on things than ever before. I like it because it makes you feel like you, you have control over your property. You can see what's going on no matter where you are, no matter what time it is. You don't have to get out of bed. You can just see it. You can talk to people if they're there. And you can get a special offer on the Ring Welcome Kit when you go to ring.com slash Clavin. The Welcome Kit includes the Ring Video Doorbell 3 and Chime Pro. It's all you need to start building custom security for your home today. Just go to ring.com slash Clavin. That's Ring. Dot com slash Clavin. And anybody comes to your door, just press the button, talk to them, say, how do you spell Clavin? It's K-L-A-V-A-N. And if they don't get <laughs> if they don't get that right, all the spotlights in your house go on. A siren goes off. It's amazing. It's amazing. There are no easy <laughs> also, the double tumbler promo is ending. Uh it says it says tomorrow, but I think it may be ending today. Is it ending today? I think it is ending today. Uh, you want to become a Daily Wire Insider Plus or All Access member. And you know why? Because tomorrow is Mailbag Day. And if you are not a member of the Daily Wire, you cannot ask questions. You are stuck with your problems forever. But if you are a member, not only if you're an uh, All Access member and Insider Plus, not only will you get two of these solid gold diamond encrusted uh, leftist tears tumblers, which are just so amazing for a solid gold, uh, you know, diamond encrusted tumbler because they're not solid gold or diamond encrusted, which makes them unique among solid gold diamond encrusted tumblers. But you can go on and ask me a question in the mailbag. Go to the daily, go to dailywire.com, hit the podcast button, hit the Andrew Claven podcast, hit that little mailbag symbol. You can ask me about politics. You can ask me about your personal life. You can ask me about religion. All my answers are guaranteed 100% correct and will change your life. Well, they change your life for the better. You won't care because you'll have two leftist tears tumblers. So it's a great deal all around. We'll be we'll be right here in just a moment with an interview uh, that you're going to want to hear about the effect that China is having in our universities. All right. We're going to talk to Cabot Phillips. He is the editor-in-chief for Campus Reform, uh, where he works to expose the left-wing bias at America's college campuses. It is great stuff. If you've never visited Campus Reform, you should. Before joining Campus Reform, he was the digital grassroots director for Marco Rubio's presidential bit. Cabot, you there? Yep. Good to be on. Oh, there you are. Uh, how you doing? I'm doing very well. Happy to be here. 
Yeah, you know, I, I want to talk to you about this thing. I've been noticing uh, China's effects, especially in Harvard. Uh, but before we get to Harvard, let's talk about it in generally. What, what is the Confucius Institute? Let's start there. Yeah, so China has essentially viewed uh, American colleges and universities as soft targets for years. We know this. Their propaganda ministry has openly said, yes, we're trying to get a foothold on American college campuses. So they open these Confucius Institutes, which sound nice. They sound very <laughs> educational and they're spreading history and culture. So what they do is they go to American universities. They say, we're going to build a $40 million brand new shiny building on your campus. We'll teach Chinese classes and, and culture and language. We'll spread it on campus and it'll come at very little cost to you. So a lot of the universities say, well, great, bring it over here. We'll take it. Not understanding the danger of having a Chinese Communist Party funded building on their campus. And then once that building gets there on campus, they start their propaganda efforts. They start to try to influence the education on campus. Looking at history courses, they start to try and, and wield influence into the rhetoric that's going on in the, in the classes, the readings that are done. They hold uh, you know, Chinese cultural events where they're educating students about the history and the modern day culture in China, when in reality, they're actually spreading, you know, revisionist history, and they're spreading, uh, you know, a, a false idea of what China is about. And so these are propaganda centers on campus. They're, they're very clear. The Department of Defense, the Pentagon have both come out, as well as other intelligence agencies in the United States. And they've said that's exactly what China is doing. China has admitted it. And yet there are almost 100 of these Confucius Institutes operating on campuses around the country with, with complete access to whatever they want on campus. And also there's the element where they're using these as hubs for their intellectual property theft efforts, where they're using these centers to get close to a lot of the data on universities, a lot of sense of research. They're now using these centers to hack into those things, smuggle them out. And then, so that's the one element of their efforts on campus. And the second element is what they're using with professors. They're, they're partnering with American professors. There was a recent professor at Harvard that was arrested for helping smuggle sensitive information to the Chinese government. There have been other cases at Duke, in Illinois, Northwestern, other colleges around the country where the Chinese government is either bribing uh, professors to smuggle them research or they are threatening uh, Chinese international students. So the students will go to America to study abroad and the Chinese government will say, if you don't bring us back sensitive information, we'll make, they'll make threats to their family, things like that. And so in that way, they're using some of the international students that come over to smuggle sensitive data out. One student, I believe out in California, was caught smuggling missile information from the US military that he had gotten uh, from his university back to the Chinese, was caught doing so. So this is kind of the, the thing that a lot of people don't want to talk about, but China does have a growing influence on American college campuses. Thankfully, people are starting to wake up to it now that we've seen uh, the, the devastation that, that has happened because of the coronavirus and their attempts to cover it up. And, and I think hopefully we can start to turn the corner and, and kick these Confucius Institutes off our campus and, and protect our you know, education system from the Chinese regime. Let me, let me unpack this for just a minute. It, the, if a Confucius Institute comes to you on your campus, what is the university getting out of this? Do they, is it just a kind of innocent, oh, we're going to get this wonderful cross-cultural uh, pollinization, or is it uh, financial as well? There are financial ties to it where the Chinese government will, uh, you know, sometimes using their subsidiary, sometimes saying it's coming from, uh, you know, a harmless grant or a private business in China, which we all know anything coming from China is essentially under the wing of the Communist Party, which they try to hide that. But there are monetary right. benefits to it for the university. The university will then advertise it and say, look, we have this rich cultural exchange program with China. It's these Confucius Institute. It sounds very philosophical and deep. And, and that's exactly what they're doing, where they are using that. And it is ironic now for the people for the last four years on the political left, and especially in academia, who have gone on endlessly about the danger of foreign interference in our election process and how important it is for us to maintain the integrity of our election process, protecting it from foreign interference, even though there's been almost no evidence that actually taking place, they now turn a blind eye when there's legitimate foreign interference going on on our college campuses, legitimate foreign interference it's indoctrination is what it is going on there. And I've actually seen this firsthand. I, I went to the University of Maryland where they have a Confucius Institute operating and I talked to students about their opinion of the Chinese government. And I said, who do you trust more, the Chinese government or, or President Trump and his administration? Student after student, well, the Chinese government, of course. And that's not to say that every one of those students had their mind changed by these Confucius Institutes, but I do think it points out the danger in allowing them to, uh, you know, to deceive people into who they are, what they're about and, and what their regime really does. 
Well, this is the other question. Aside from any financial benefit a university gets, we know that universities are hotbeds of leftism. I mean, they've, they've gone out of their way basically to bar anybody who doesn't toe the leftist line from working in a lot of universities. Is there sympathy between the left in this country and the Chinese philosophically? I mean, it's, it's a little hard to wrap your head around because the Chinese have committed such atrocities, their treatment of the Uyghur Muslims, of course, and their uh, treatment of dissidents, the way dissidents disappear. And yet we just saw a, uh, a piece in The Atlantic written by a Harvard law professor, co-written by a Harvard law professor, where he said their idea of surveilling people and censoring the Internet is the right idea and we should imitate it here uh, through Facebook and Twitter and all this. So do they actually sympathize? Are they happy to have these people? When, when you confront them, are they happy, in fact, to have these people on campus? Well, I think the big part of it is they're they're ignorant. So when you whenever you bring this okay. up to people and whenever you say, "Hey, are you concerned about this?" Many times the university will respond and, and be ignorant. They'll say, "No, this is there's no no problem with these centers. This is not a danger." And a lot of the students, I've been on over 100 college campuses. I've interviewed thousands of students about topics like this and similar ones, and a lot of times they just have no idea. They think, "Oh, well, all culture is good. No one culture is worse than any other culture." It's this cultural relativism, uh, yeah. you know, thing that has brainwashed them. And so they think, well, it can't be that bad. And so when you start to actually talk to them about the atrocities of the government, you say, hey, we're for tolerance, right? We're for open-mindedness and diversity, right? Those are all good things. Then why are we okay with the Chinese government that has thrown people in concentration camps for their religion or has censored people by the billion uh, with a B? What's wrong with that? I, that doesn't really fall in line with diversity and inclusion, does it? And, and a lot of times they don't really see that because they're not aware of what's going on. And I think one reason this has go, been able to go on for so long is because people are afraid to call out the Chinese government because they're afraid of being called racist. Because there's it's impossible for many people to separate criticizing the Chinese government from criticizing Chinese these people. And a lot of these universities say, we just, we don't want to cause any problems. And a lot of students say, I don't want to be labeled a racist or a bigot if I point out or question the presence of these centers on my campus, or if I question, uh, you know, what I'm hearing about China, because I don't want to be viewed as intolerant for coming out against Chinese people. And we got to be able to criticize bad ideas, criticize dangerous regimes without criticizing an entire people group, which of course that's not happening. So in a way, this political correctness has played a role and allowing this to go on for so long. And thankfully, there has been some movement lately. Congress recently this week actually announced that they were going to be investigating uh, China's ties to our college campuses. We've seen people like Senator Ted Cruz, uh, Josh Hawley leading the way on making sure that these Confucius Institutes are being shut down. Uh, thankfully, about two dozen of them have been shut down in the last year or two. There are still uh, a little under 100 still operating. And that's not even to uh, you know account for all the money universities are getting, but there is an investigation going on into schools that are underreporting. There are schools that have received tens of millions of dollars from the Chinese government and other Chinese entities that have underreported it. They've either tried to hide it and it's been exposed, and now they say, well, uh, you know, this isn't what it looks like. And so those universities are being investigated now. But uh, at my point of view, what's to investigate? We already know what's going on. The DOD, Pentagon have been very clear. Our intelligence communities have been clear about Chinese efforts to do so. China has admitted it. It's time for action. It's, it's not time for just more nice things of, well, look into it. It's time for action from our government and from campuses themselves. You know, you mentioned this uh, thing in Harvard, this guy, uh, Charles Lieber, uh, was arrested. Now, he was arrested. It was kind of like, <laughs> reminded me a little bit of Al, Al Capone being busted for tax evasion. He was arrested for not reporting uh, money he had gotten from China when he had to report it under the terms of his $15 million worth of grants, of federal grants. So he violated the terms of his grant of his federal grants by not reporting the money he was getting from China. But he was part of this thing called the Thousand Talents <laughs> Program, which couldn't sound any more Maoist if they tried. I mean, it just sounds like such a mouse. But this thing has been essentially identified by our intelligence agencies as a, an espionage operation. Yeah. How how deep is that and deeply is that entrenched in the universities? Well, there have already been numerous cases we have up on our site at Campus Reform detailing what uh, has been done when it comes to espionage efforts and, and using professors and using research and things of that nature. And for a lot of these professors, they'll say, well, you know, I'm just doing this for the good of science. I'm contributing my research. Many times they're actually taking federal research dollars from American taxpayers, conducting research, and then in, in some cases selling it to the highest bidder, which is often the Chinese government. So they're uh, taking advantage of American taxpayers to now make money and sell it to a foreign adversary. And so I think this is gonna be something that in the future people look back on and say, 
how in the world did people turn a blind eye when this was going yeah. on? And that's and that's not even counting the amount of students that have been caught trying to smuggle information out to the government. And so I, I do think it's time for the government. I, I'm very hesitant to say that the federal government needs to sweep in and, and do anything. I'm very hesitant on that. But when it comes to national security, when it comes to the compromising of our education yeah. system, I do think there's a role for the federal government to say, hey, you're not going to be taking money from the Chinese government. You're not going to be selling sensitive information to the government. And we are going to keep more of an eye on what kind of funding is coming from the Chinese government onto our campuses and into our students' lives. You know, this guy in Harvard was actually working for one of the Wuhan labs. And the fact that the press isn't covering it uh, tells us a lot about the press as well. Cabot Phillips, he's the editor-in-chief for Campus Reform. If you've never gone on their site, you should. It is really terrific. Cabot Thanks very much. I hope you come back and talk again. We'd love that. Thanks so much, Andrew. I got to stop there. I'm out of time. But remember, the mailbag is tomorrow. You do not want to have your problems around for another week. They take up room. They make the rent more costly. I will solve them all. Come to dailywire.com and subscribe. If you're an all access member, if you're up in our top tiers of members, we will send you two leftist tiers tumblers which you will be able to drink from while I solve all your problems in the mailbag. I'll talk to you tomorrow. I'm Andrew Claven. This is The Andrew Claven Show. The Andrew Claven Show is produced by Robert Sterling and directed by Mike Joyner. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Technical producer, Austin Stevens. And our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. Assistant director, Pavel Wydowski. Edited by Adam Syabitz. Audio mixed by Robin Fenderson. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. Animations are by Cynthia Angulo. Production assistants, McKenna Waters and Ryan Love. The Andrew Claven Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2020. You know, the Matt Wall Show, it's not just another show about, about politics. I think there are enough of those already out there. We talk about culture because culture drives politics and it drives everything else. So my main focuses are life, family, faith, those are fundamental, and that's what this show is about. I hope you'll give it a listen.